Okay, hi. Um, so, uh, welcome to the last part of uh, the video, which uh, what we're going to do now here is to talk about the bootstrap argument that would give us the gradient estimate that we want. Okay. Okay, so these sort of like bootstrapping often happens in analysis where um, once you do like a technique or like a, a trick, it sort of gives you something that kind of looks like what you need but not enough. Uh -huh. So you sort of repeat the argument again and it creates this kind of, I kind of want to think of it like some kind of a feedback loop of some sort where you get an improvement each time and you do it like finitely many times, then you get the result that you want. Okay. So let's see. So, so far what we've done is um, we, okay, so what we want is to obtain Hilder regularity of weak solutions. And we do that by obtaining a gradient estimate where um, it's controlled by some specific power of the radius of, of some ball. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started the proof, we talked about heuristics and stuff like that and the general perturbation technique. And then um, the second part dealt mostly with estimates and we've seen their uh, common tricks that people use to obtain estimates for uh, solutions to PDEs. And now we do the bootstrap argument. Okay, so but before we start, kind of want to point out a typo from the previous video. So this is the estimate that we left off from the previous one, but this is supposed to be B, uh, the radius of this ball, ball is supposed to be rho, and rho is smaller than r. In the previous video, it's r, okay, so it's supposed to be rho. Okay, let's, uh, let's make some observations. Um, okay, note that I can look at these functions here, the gradient of u, I can look at them as functions of, uh, like, um, of the radius of the ball. So this is like phi of rho and this is phi of r. Mm -hmm. And the observation is that phi, uh, these are non-negative, it's non-negative, and that this is non-decreasing. And that is clear. Uh -huh. um, okay. Another thing that I kind of want to point out here is uh, let's look at this term. Uh -huh. We are going to introduce a technical lemma later uh -huh, for which if we can write this term as r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha times maybe a constant where this would absorb this uh -huh, multiplied to L2 norm of u or even h1 norm of u plus this term here lq norm squared uh -huh. then a technique if if i can write this as something like this term the, uh, a technical lemma that we're going to introduce later would give us the gradient estimate that we want uh -huh. so the key things to note here is this can be made small uh, you have here rho to the n n is bigger than this one, note that alpha is less than 1, so this is um, negative, uh -huh. so that this whole thing is less than n. So those are the key uh, observations. Another one is we can look at these as functions of the radius, it's not negative and it's not decreasing. Okay, so it all kind of looks abstract and I really don't have a good motivation for it because the book didn't really motivate it and I'm not quite sure like how people came up with it, so I don't know. But what I can say at this point is that uh, with those observations that these can be thought of as functions of non-negative functions of the radius, if somehow I can write this in terms of like a bunch of constants times this power of r, and that this is less than this n here, then a technical lemma would give me the gradient <laughs> estimate that I need. Now to answer the question, well, um, how did you come up with the technical lemma? I do not know. So uh, if uh, someone knows, uh, uh, I welcome the, uh, the explanation. 
Okay. So what is this magical technical lemma that we're talking about? That it really has nothing to do with PDEs. It's a lemma about uh, non-negative decrease, uh, non-negative non-decreasing functions. So we write it down. So the auxiliary lemma is. Okay. Different color. How much space do I? Okay, plenty of space. If I have uh, a function phi. And this is non-negative, non-decreasing on 0R. And I have that the following holds. Uh, phi of rho is less than or equal to A of rho over R uh, to some alpha plus some epsilon here plus B R to the beta. This is for rho smaller than less than or equal to R, less than or equal to some big R. Mm -hmm. uh, another important thing is beta is less than alpha and all the constants are non-negative uh -huh. then the conclusion is for every gamma between beta and alpha uh, there exists some epsilon zero positive such that for small epsilons mm -hmm, we have the following you have phi of rho less than or equal to some constant uh, you have rho over r so the epsilon there disappears to the gamma phi of r plus b um, rho to the beta uh -huh. so in particular if you said okay i don't have much space okay um, before we go to the specifics, let's sort of look at this one because it's, it's a lot. So it, it's a lemma that is not really related to PDEs. It's about non-decreasing, uh, non-negative functions. So if you have this estimate, uh, has some kind of a growth estimate on, uh, on phi, I'm missing something here. I am sorry. This is phi of r. Yes. If you have this growth estimate on uh, on phi, then it gives you um, a more naive growth estimate. That's okay. That's how uh, we will interpret it. If you have this growth estimate, you get like this sort of sharper uh, growth estimate on phi. And this is you particularly useful for us uh -huh, because uh -huh, so we look at a particular case. Okay, so in particular, uh, if I said um, uh, we have it in the case where you have this, mm -hmm. so instead of you have two things, little rho, uh, you have rho and little r, okay, you just have here little r, in particular you have something like this. Uh, R over big R, gamma, T of big R. Uh, am I doing this right? I think so. Plus B rho, so that's R to the beta. Okay, note that uh, beta here is less than gamma. So what I'm going to do is I am going to pull out um, this power of R, R to the beta, and then I'm left with r to the gamma minus beta. Note that this is positive over r to the gamma, p of r plus b. And note that these things are bounded. Uh -huh. Now remember, remember, uh, at the start of this video, we were talking about this estimate here, and we're saying that, oh, we can look at these as functions of the radius. Uh -huh. It's uh, some p of r, which is, non-negative and non-decreasing and we're going to show that we can sort of reduce this estimate into something of this form so that we can use it in order to get something like this so this is going to be something like the gradient of uh, the l2 norm squared of the gradient of u we get a bunch of constants and we get this 
power of r. So we would want beta to be n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. So we sort of want beta to be n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. So that is the exponent that we need to give us the gradient estimate that we want to give us Hilder continuity using the result that we had in Campanato spaces. Okay, so it looks very technical. The proof is uh, not too difficult, but it doesn't involve PDE, so uh, we are not gonna discuss that. But that's the idea. Uh -huh. um, the idea is this estimate here um, can be made to look into something like this, which would allow us to write uh, to obtain an estimate like this, and this gives a gradient estimate. Okay, so it, uh, lots of symbols, but uh, that's the train of thought. Okay, estimate here can be made into this. This lemma then gives us this. This is the gradient estimate that we want because it's square of L2 norm of grad controlled by a bunch of constants times this power of R. So using the theorem on Campanato spaces, it gives you Hilder continuity. Okay, so to do that, we consider two cases. Uh -huh. So it hinges on, let's look at this. It, uh, it hinges on whether C is zero or not necessarily zero. And the proof when C is zero is easy. Why, look, uh, can you see why? If C is zero, then what do you have? You're just left with this term, which already has a power of R. And this term here that kind of looks like this one. Okay. So uh, the case when c equals zero actually is going to be a direct application of this lemma. That's why we're sort of singling it out. We're not going to use any uh, bootstrap argument for that. Okay. And in fact, the estimate that you get is different. So into that. So case one, C is equivalent to zero. So in that case, what you have is the following estimate. You have uh, integral B rho uh, grad u squared less than or equal to some constant times. I'm going to try and write a bit faster. Uh, let's see. You have here, I want to, I want it to look like the lemma. So let's write it as this, grad u squared uh, br x0 plus tau squared r. Okay, let's push it to grad u squared uh, b1. Okay, that's the largest possible value. Plus r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha times lq norm of f b1. So we have something like this. Okay, okay. Um, wait, is this, uh, is this what I want? Hmm. Wait, give me a sec. I was looking at something different. I am sorry. Uh, give me a sec. Okay, I, I made a mistake. I was looking at the conclusion. Um, so uh, this doesn't have a fee, okay, I'm sorry, okay. So uh, it's not too drastic, okay, we just, again, we just need to show that it satisfies an estimate something like this, and we're, we're, we're still fine, okay. So with that in mind, I'm going to rewrite my estimate as I said like a bunch of maybe wrong things. I'm sorry. Uh, if we have this, earlier I was saying something like the control like involves P of R. Just disregard whenever I would say like we have a P of R estimate here. Okay. Nothing too major. Nothing too major. Okay. Okay. So what am I doing? Uh, I'm just writing out the estimate when C is zero. Okay. So that will be... It's getting a bit late, <laughs> a bit tired, I'm sorry. So this is uh, rho over r to the n plus tau squared uh, of r. Then let's push this to uh, grad u squared. I'm thinking, do I want to push this to 
Wait, let me just check the book. Give me a few uh, seconds. There's something there. Because maybe I've written the technical lemma wrong. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. The technical lemma is supposed to look like this. Okay, this is where the P of R is supposed to be. Okay, okay, but same, same, uh, same plan. We want this to look like this. Okay. Then that is how I'm gonna write it. Um, B R of X zero. I was debating whether this is supposed to be um, B integral over B one or B or B R, but we want it to be B R. Okay. Um, plus. What else? Um, okay, so my notes were correct. Uh, R and minus two plus two alpha. Okay, so remember that this is P of R and this is uh, P of rho. So you have here um, some, what they have it? In the notes this is beta smaller than alpha okay and this sort of takes the role of epsilon in the technical lemma okay so uh, using the technical lemma directly uh, so by the lemma it already gives us the following result it gives us the um, existence of this epsilon zero such that whenever epsilon is less than epsilon zero, so what does that mean? Whenever this thing here is less than epsilon zero, so whenever tau squared of r is less than epsilon zero, which note that tau uh, is um, non-increasing, so that this is equivalent to saying that um, r is less than some r zero, so for small r. Note that for small, it, this is a perturbation argument. Small r means that um, we're not too far away from where we have frozen the um, leading coefficient matrix. Okay. Okay, so there exists some epsilon zero such that uh, whenever this is true, so if, and we can, we can make that happen. We can make that happen because so it's just saying that we're not too far from where we froze um, the matrix. Uh -huh. So if we're close to that, then we have the following. You just write it down, B row of X zero, try to use squared less than or equal to some constant. Um, the technical lemma says that for every gamma, Remember, it's like for every gamma in, um, what is that? Alpha to beta. So in this case, I'm going to take gamma to be the average of this and this one. Uh -huh. So that is, so gamma appears here. So I have for R0, uh, the average is N minus 1 plus alpha. I have here grad U squared BR of x0 plus rho of n minus 2 plus 2 alpha f squared lq of b1 okay so yeah the point of the lemma is that we can transform this into this uh -huh. uh, because rho here is the radius of this of this ball here okay Okay, and why do we want that? Why do we want that? Because I can factor out that power of rho. Excuse me. Excuse me. So I'm left with rho to 1 minus alpha. Note that this is positive over r0 to n minus 1 plus alpha. Uh, so, is it still this? Yes. 
um, grad u squared br x zero plus this one uh -huh. and this term here is bounded by a constant so eventually let's sort of just shift things up so we have more space Uh, we have that this is less than or equal to some constant, rho n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. I have L2 norm of uh, grad u squared plus uh, square of the LQ norm of f. Uh -huh. So this is what we want. This is the big magic gradient estimate. The L2 norm of grad u in the ball of rate rho squared uh -huh, is controlled by this quantity here times a bunch of constants independent of just dependent on like uh, the electricity constants and stuff like that times the rate this is the important part times the radius raised to this particular power that's the magic key that would give us Hilder continuity okay okay and I can would like to point out that in the case when c equals zero instead of h1 norm of u what appears is l2 a smaller const uh, a smaller control it's the l2 norm of or the square of the l2 norm of grad u mm -hmm. so that's like a special case when c equals zero we didn't need any bootstrap argument using the technical lemma we got the gradient estimate that we need okay so let's go to the complicated technical one okay Okay, so case two, general case. Okay, so just some notation. Let's denote chi of f to be this. So I don't have, to, uh, we don't have to keep on writing it. The square of the LQ norm of f b1 okay okay so what do we know so far so what we know w w k so what we know is that the l2 norm of grad u in the ball of radius row is controlled by constant times uh, we have this rho for r to the n plus tau squared of r um, grad u squared uh, br of x0 plus um, r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha chi of f plus um, u squared br of x0. So you might be wondering, oh, Ryuji, Ryuji uh, where did the c term go uh, i thought that we were in the general case and c is not necessarily zero uh, it just got absorbed into this constant here okay so c not being zero uh it gets absorbed in this constant but moreover it means that we have another term here that wasn't present in the earlier case okay it's this one and it's this term and that actually makes uh, things um, uh, a bit more difficult. Okay, so the goal is, the goal is we actually would want, we want this to look something like r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha times chi of f plus, so you might be thinking that it's natural to want it to be like u squared uh, b1. Uh -huh. But, but but um, uh, we are going to uh, use another technical lemma that allows us to uh, estimate this term with something uh, involving the radius uh, r. Mm -hmm. And that lemma uh, requires some control on the derivative. Uh -huh. So again... Um, if I want to control this by something with R, um, and you kind of have a feel for that, like um, uh, Poincaré inequality would give you, would would uh, make that R pop out. 
So um, what I'm saying here is, if I want control of this with R, the gradient has to be involved. So if the gradient has to be involved, eventually the estimate that we have here would contain the gradient. So um, what I'm saying is, even though you might be wondering, oh, it's natural to just expect something of this form because of the controls that we have access to for, uh, for this term that involves R and that control is with the gradient, um, it's actually more natural to expect something not of this form, but of the form uh, h1 uh, norm. So the h1 norm of u squared. So instead of just the gradient of u, the L2 norm of the gradient. So this is different from the case when c equals 0. When c equals 0, you just have the gradient, L2 norm of the gradient. In the general case, you actually need the stronger um, h1 uh, estimate. Okay, okay, so how do we make this appear? So we make the following claim and we are going to work towards proving that claim. And once we have that claim, we are done. Okay, what is the claim? So the claim is, I had um, there some bit of like technical stuff. Uh, for every x in this ball, so you can, this you can sort of think that we imposed these conditions so that the balls that we consider would always be in B one, and that we have this string here. The following holds. plus r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha of what is this um, chi of f plus uh, h1 norm of u squared okay so this is the magic estimate that we want and uh, I I hope that um, uh, it makes sense to look for this estimate because once you have this estimate, note that again this is less than this, you can use the technical lemma to replace this by rho and that you can make this small. Note that the technical lemma requires this to be small, which you can do, you can do. And that, what that means is you're just making the perturbations small. Okay, so this is a measure of the perturbation. So you're just making the perturbation small. So once you, again, once you have something like this, I can replace this with rho, this vanishes, and then I can pull this power of rho outside. And that is the gradient estimate that I need in order to conclude Hilder continuity. Okay, does that make sense? So the ultimate goal is to prove this claim because once we have this claim, I can replace this by rho to this power and then factor it out. And yes, and that hinges on a, a bunch of things like, for example, this being smaller than this and making this small, mm -hmm, which is akin to uh, making the perturbation small. Okay, so we are almost there. So before that, we introduce another technical lemma. So, so before we proceed, I just kind of want to emphasize something. Uh -huh. At some point, we're going to do a series on existence of weak solutions. And if you watch my preliminary video, the, uh, the reason that we bother with weak solutions is that by, make, by looking for more general solutions, it makes it easier to find them, okay? So uh, getting weak solutions, it's actually fairly straightforward to prove, uh -huh. but the difficult part is uh, showing that your weak solutions have better regularity, and this is what we're doing now, like with um, um, 
sparse conditions on the coefficients and stuff like that, we want to show that u being a weak solution actually is something better. It is Hilder continuous. Now that, uh, as you've seen in this trio of videos, is very <laughs> technical and uh, fairly difficult to do, like relative to showing that weak solutions exist. So yeah, that I would say <laughs> kind of makes the study of PDEs exciting. And in fact, um, the million dollar uh, question, uh, uh, it's part of the millennium problems. Uh, it has something to do with showing that the some notion of a weak solution for the Navier-Stokes equations that they're actually smooth. So that is a regularity question. So regularity questions for PDEs, they're actually very important and non-trivial. And in general, very difficult. Like, like with that, <laughs> there's a million dollar like, price um, connected with that. I'm, I'm thinking of doing um, a Navier-Stokes uh, series at some point because uh, in my research I had to um, brush up on Navier Stokes Stokes or Stokes again so we might do a series on that that would be fun okay but for now uh, I was saying that regularity is hard okay so going back we uh, recall another technical lemma okay, okay. Is this like the second or third technical lemma we have for this set of videos? The technical lemma is this one. Uh, did I? Oh no, that is new. Okay, for u in h1, uh, h1 omega, but the following. If you have this control on the gradient, for some positive constant m and mu here is in uh, the interval close at zero open at n and for every ball of radius r excuse me continue in omega then for every subdomain compactly contained in omega uh, there holds that for every ball in here with x0 in omega prime, the following holds dr of x0 Whew, u squared less than or equal to some constant in lambda mu omega prime omega m plus u squared. Okay, we're gonna try and pick this apart later. E screen. Okay, where lambda is this. It's either mu plus 2, in the case mu is less than n minus 2, or it's, it's any arbitrary value in 0n whenever n minus 2 less than equal to mu less than n. Okay, it's a lot. Let's Okay, so going back, okay, so I was saying that it is a lot, but let's try and pick this apart. Well, the reason that we want uh, this lemma is, remember uh, earlier, um, where was that? We were saying that we want uh, some kind of a different control on this one involving um, uh, the, the radius rho. Mm -hmm. I think I was saying R. It should be like row. I'm sorry. This is supposed to be row. I'm tired. It's late. Okay. So that lemma actually gives us that. If you look at the conclusion of the lemma, uh, it gives you that power. Um, it gives you R to the lambda. It's not going to be exactly, it's not necessarily going to be exactly the right power that you have, that you need. Uh -huh. It's going to be these, so there are cases, but this is where the bootstrapping would come into play. You sort of like repeat the argument until you, you get the right power of lambda here. Okay. So what is this lemma saying? Uh -huh. 
if I have control on the gradient, then I have control on, on the function, uh -huh, which kind of makes sense. Uh, this is a technical lemma, but the proof actually relies on uh, Poincaré's inequality, which gives you that relationship between function and uh, the gradient. And Poincaré's inequality actually like, gives you that factor of R. Okay, so it kind of looks complicated, but what it really is saying is if you have control on the gradient and the control is in terms of R, then you have control on the function in terms of R, which is what you want. And note that here, M here appears here. Okay, okay, so we have that. Uh -huh. So we're going to use that. Okay. So for the first iteration, it's not really an iteration. Okay, so for the first one, observe that uh, for this ball containing omega, we had the following. Um, R to the zero, this is just one, R is positive. B1. So this is sort of like your M. Mm -hmm. And this is this is trivial uh, because um, this is not omega, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be B1. Uh -huh. So this is trivial because BR uh, X0 is containing B1. Okay. So this is the control on the gradient. Uh -huh. Then we use the lemma in order to give us the control on the function. Okay, so in the book, they say that there, there would exist some other radius R1, and I'm not quite sure why that is true, how that comes from the lemma. So I am just going to say that we can fix some R1, and I am going to try and draw a picture. So just to see what's happening here, we fix some R1, uh huh. Then uh, you have the PR one is going to be compactly containing B one and for um, R less than one minus R one, we have the following. So before we go to the conclusion coming from the lemma, uh, let's sort of draw what's happening here because there are uh, a bunch of uh, uh, balls being mentioned here. Okay, so let's first start off with B1. So B1 is the largest ball. Oh, oops. B1 is the largest ball. And I have B1 half. Use this. Sorry. Okay. Uh huh. B one half and B R one. Let's use this one. Let's make this a bit smaller. There we go. Okay. So centered at the origin, zero. So this is um, B1 half. Uh, this is uh, BR1. So R1 has radius uh, R1 bigger than 1 half but less than 1. So this is B1. Okay. Now we are going to take a ball. Um, uh, BR x0 and x0 is in R1 so we consider we take x0 in BR1 and then we consider the ball uh, of radius R centered at x0 where the, we impose this condition on R and what that means is so we take a ball uh, <coughs> excuse me how does this so, 
take x0 somewhere here and then a ball let's just move that a bit note that so what do I want to say um, it's fairly easy to show that uh, the ball centered at x0 of radius r is contained in b1 okay and that's easy. I leave it as an exercise. So this is like a picture of like what's happening. Okay. So um, I hope uh, I feel like I'm a bit con uh, confusing here. So what what's happening? Uh, we need to use a technical lemma, and to do that, we start off with the control in the gradient. So we have this as the control. This is m, and this is mu. Mu is zero. So the lemma gives us a control on the function. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, this is what I was confused with the book. The book says that there exists some R1, and I'm not quite sure whether that is a consequence from the lemma, or you can just choose any R1, such that the R1 is compactly contained in B1, and that is sort of what I did here. And then uh, uh, I am considering these like little balls, the, these little purple balls that... Um, are centered at points contained in BR1, but would still be contained in B1, okay? So now applying the lemma gives us this one. So note that the lemma says that you have this control on the function on balls inside B1, okay? So applying the lemma, you have u squared less than or equal to some constant r raised to lambda. So I'm calling lambda here delta 1. Delta 1 times um, m, which is this, plus we have this control. With, okay, so delta 1, okay, let's first sort of follow exactly what the lemma says. So it's either going to be mu, so mu is 0, plus 2, when um, mu, which is 0, is less than n minus 2, or any arbitrary thing in 0n, uh -huh, when this is true, note that uh, this thing is like trivial, so let's write that in something more nice something nicer so delta one is either two when n is bigger than two or any arbitrary number in this interval we're just regarding zero because we want an improvement uh this is when n is equal to two okay so we have two possible deltas okay so let's see what is happening here um gradient control tells me that I have this control on the L2 norm of U in balls compactly containing B1. Okay? That is what that is saying. And the control is, uh -huh, we have a bunch of things, but the important thing here is you have the radius of the ball raised to some power, positive power. Because we started off with zero power, now we have something positive. Remember that eventually... We're going to add things and everything, but eventually we want to reach n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. So I hope that you see here the bootstrapping thing uh, that is happening, sort of. There is an increase in the power of R. So we have here 0, it becomes something positive, delta 1, which is either 2 or any arbitrary thing from 0 to m. Okay? Now let's consider cases. Okay almost done okay um, so let's just okay so why are we doing that why are we doing that what is the estimate that we have this is what we know the bwk this is what we know this is bounded by this and what did we say what did we say we want to replace this term by something like this okay and that um, in order to do that, I need to estimate these terms in terms of something with rho. Mm -hmm. And that is what the lemma is for. So, doing one step of the lemma, we can rewrite this 
in terms of something else because the lemma allows us to estimate this term and I'm gonna write that down so um, combining that estimate with the result from the lemma what we have is um, L2 norm of grad in B rho is less than or equal to C I, I, I should just have just copied these things um, what is this? Rho over r to the n plus tau squared r times L2 norm of grad plus r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha chi of f plus r to the delta 1 u squared h1 b1. Uh, note that uh, this is square of the h1 norm okay now we need this little special term let's go for that pink because pink is fun okay so we are sort of closer to what we want what do we want we want this times this plus that we're not there yet because this is delta one not this one okay so let's see, can we, at this point, would it be possible to push it to the desired exponent? Let us see, because note that delta 1 can assume many va possible values depending on what case we are in. Okay, so let's see the cases. So when n is equal to 2, uh, note that delta 1 is arbitrary in 0 2 n is 2 remember delta 1 in case n equals to any arbitrary thing here so in in this case what you do is you choose delta 1 to be equal to 2 alpha uh -huh. and if you do that um, we are done. Aha, uh -huh. wait, let me just, uh, see. Uh, just give me a sec. And note that this is less than your want. Uh, give me a sec. I had this before, I'm just getting tired. Why is, why are we done? Um, Delta 1 is 2 alpha, then it is clear to me earlier <laughs> today. Uh, why are we done when delta 1 is 2 alpha? are we done um, let me think yes okay <laughs> I, okay I was like why are we it's not n minus 2 plus 2 alpha but we are in the case when n equals 2 okay why are we done because n minus 2 plus 2 alpha in the case n equals 2 is what? So this is 2 minus 2 plus 2 alpha. So this is precisely 2 alpha. We get the exponent that we want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me backtrack a bit. I'm sorry. I, um, when n equals 2, delta 1 is any arbitrary number in this interval. And I'm saying that, okay, just choose delta 1 to be 2 alpha. Note that alpha is in 0, 1, so that 2 alpha is in um, 0, 2, sorry. Mm -hmm. And note that um, in the case n equals 2, n minus 2 plus 2 alpha is just 2 alpha. So we have the right exponent. We are done in this case. Okay, good news. We are done. What are the other cases? Uh, before we proceed, I would just like to emphasize that once you have matching powers of R here, then you can use the other technical lemma that we have earlier, 
where you can replace those uh -huh, by rho to that power mm -hmm, and you don't have this anymore, then you can factor it out. So you get the gradient estimate with the correct power of the radius, okay? And again, the perturbation comes into play with um, the lemma requires uh, this being small, which you can do, and that is fine, okay? Okay. Okay, so we are done. Okay, are we, are, are we, I hope we are clear with that. We want the powers to match so that you can use the technical lemma in order to say that I can make this small and then I can repli replace these with rows, this row, factor this with row out, and you get the correct gradient estimate that you need, okay? Okay. It's one case. The other case, so that's the case when n equals 2, what happens when n is bigger than 2? So when n is bigger than 2, delta 1 is just 2. It's not an, any arbitrary thing. So we consider subcases. In the subcase, uh -huh, when n is bigger than 2, and you have n minus 2 plus 2 alpha, excuse me, is less than or equal to 2. Note that this is positive, this is um, something less than 2, uh, you're adding th these things, e either you overshoot so you go beyond 2 or it's less than equal to 2, so we, we're in that case less than equal to 2. So in this case, uh -huh, let us compare r to the delta 1, which is r squared, and r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. Okay, so this is less than 2, and note that r is small, so r is less than 1 actually, note that r is in 0, 1. So which is bigger? So since r is in 0, 1, and this is smaller than that, which is bigger? This one, okay. So that in this case, uh-huh. The term, so you have, in the estimate, you have a term r to the delta 1, um, u squared h1 b1. So this is just r squared u squared h1 b1. I can replace this with, so this is less than or equal to r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha u squared h1 b1. So you have that this matches uh, the other uh, term with the f. Where is that? So this here is the same as this one. So you can use the auxiliary lemma to make this small and then replace it, these with rows and, and so on. Okay. So in such, such, such a case, we are done. Okay, so in this subcase, we are done. The remaining subcase is this one. So let's see. So, so far we haven't like applied a bootstrapping argument because we are always leading up to like the point where, okay, we're done. So this is where actually we're gonna apply a bootstrapping thing. So the next case is n is bigger than two and you have n minus two plus two alpha bigger than two. So the opposite of this one. Whew. Okay, so in this case, uh, the comparisons of those powers of R, they would reverse. So what you have here instead is that R to the N minus 2 plus 2 alpha is instead less than R squared, which is R to the delta 1. Uh -huh. So that in this case, we get the estimate. Okay, what do we get? Um, we get grad u squared, b rho of x0, less than or equal to some constant. Ooh, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, rho per r to the n plus tau squared of r. Uh -huh. uh, grad u squared, b r of x0. Plus, you have here r squared. Uh -huh. So, you replace the, the this with r squared okay so you might be wondering but that is the power that i want why am i replacing this 
it's fine, it's fine. Uh, we're gonna do a bootstrapping argument in order to reach this eventually. Uh -huh. But at this point, if we uh, keep kept this and did R square for the other one, um, kind of like we're gonna be stuck. Okay, so we are replacing it with R squared and then we have here um, chi of F plus U squared H1 of B1. Okay, so note that we are in the case where n is bigger than 2. So we are going to use the other technical lemma on non-decreasing non-negative functions in order to say something about this. Okay, so this is where the bootstrap is. Um, the repeating argument really is the um, control on the gradient to give you control on the function. Which lemma was that? Kind of like this one. Uh -huh. So, um, what we're going to do at this point is, this is less than that. So, we are going to use the other technical lemma on non-negative, non-decreasing functions in order to give us the control on the gradient. Because that lemma actually gives you, says that this is going to be less than or equal to something. So, Yes, that is the crux of the argument, okay? Uh, uh, I hope that I'm explaining it well. Uh, so in this case, you have this thing here. Note, so we had to replace this by something which is not what we want. But by doing that, it allows us to use a technical lemma to give us a control on the gradient. And that control on the gradient allows us to use, to, to sort of like repeat the argument and hope to get something better. Remember that uh, for the first iteration, we went from control on the gradient, something from r to the zero to r to the delta one. And delta one is bigger, it's positive. So hopefully, so we have here two, uh -huh, which uh, is smaller than n minus 2 plus 2 alpha, I think. So uh, hopefully doing it again and again, eventually we would get to the right power, okay? So bootstrapping is from this estimate, use auxiliary lemma to get control on gradient, then use another auxiliary lemma in order to increase this power. Eventually you get to n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. Okay, uh -huh. so let's write that down. We're, we are almost done. So, by an auxiliary lemma, you have that. Okay, let's see. Let's see what I have here. So there exists some radius R1. So remember the R0 came from that auxiliary lemma. You want um, R smaller than R0 in order to make tau squared small. So this is the next one. Uh -huh. Repeating that lemma again gives us a different R and we're calling that R1. Such that every X in BR1 and uh, what do we have here? 0 less than r less than 1 minus r1. We have the following. So this is the gradient control. And I'm already like factored out r squared. Uh -huh. So r squared chi of f plus square of L2 norm, uh, h1 norm of Okay, so this is the technical lemma with the non-negative, non-decreasing function. Uh, and I already factored out the R squared there, and we get this. So this is the gradient control that we need in order to use the other uh, auxiliary lemma, which I'm just going to say here. So by the other auxiliary lemma, We have uh, that there exists another r, one half to r one, uh, such that you probably disregard these at this point. Like, I know we're all tired. 
and 0 less than r less than equal to r1 minus r2. Okay. So this gives us, so gradient control gives us control on the function uh, times a factor of a power of r. So and then let's write that down. So we have vr of x0 v squared less than or equal to c r. So we have a different power here, delta 2 times uh, this, which is m. Okay, so this is really just an application of that auxiliary lemma. So the question here is, do we actually have an improvement? So it depends on what delta 2 is. Delta 2 must be bigger than delta 1 in order to say that we actually have improved something. So let us verify that. What is delta 2? So delta 2 is going to be equal to, um, here mu is 2, mu is 2. So it's going to be either mu plus 2, which is 4, in the case when n is bigger than 4, or it can be any arbitrary thing. Uh, you can check that um, it's 2 to n when either n is 3 or 4. Okay? Now, note that we are left with this case because it's the runoff from the case n greater than 2 and something, something else. Okay, so that's why we're disregarding n equals 2 here. Okay, so uh, we have this, which is an improvement to delta 1. Remember what is delta 1? Delta 1 is either 2 in some case and any arbitrary thing in 0, 2. So we get something bigger. Uh -huh. So the observation is, what is the observation? The observation is delta k increases after each iteration. Uh -huh. So eventually, eventually, you can repeat the cases. Uh -huh. You can just repeat the cases and you, uh, you come to the point where you need to do the iteration. Do the iteration again. And you sort of repeat it up until you get delta k to be greater than or equal to n minus 2 plus 2 alpha. And once you've reached that, the powers of the r's or the, the r's would match. Uh -huh. Why? Let's, let's look at this again. So you would, uh, the deltas would increase. So you would reach a point where this is now bigger than this. So in that case, this is less than or equal to this. So the powers already match. And then you can use the technical lemma in order to make this small, replace this with rho, and then get the correct gradient estimate that you need. So with that, uh -huh, we are actually done. Uh -huh. So it looks like a lot, but let's sort of recap uh, what happened here. So, uh, based on some sparse conditions, continuity assumptions on the leading coefficient, stronger integrability conditions on CNF, we can show that the weak solution is actually Hilder continuous in C alpha. Okay. So, to do that is we broke it apart into three parts. First one is the perturbation argument, and we've talked about a heuristic uh, about that. We sort of freeze the leading coefficient and then sort of like move things around, subtract like an equation for a harmonic functions and stuff like that. The second part is you work with estimates and you choose uh, some kind of a particular uh, function as a test function and then you handle uh, each of the terms separately where um, uh, you use standard techniques like Hilder inequality, Sobolev inequality, Young's inequality with epsilon. The third one is the bootstrapping argument, and it's, I think, I mean, to me, it felt like the most technical one. And it involves um, uh, getting the correct uh, power of R, and it's, uh, it involves this interplay between these two lemmas. So we've seen that, okay, um, we want to get something. So it really relied on gradient estimates on U, and 
the first one is straightforward uh it's trivial so it gives so you do an iteration it gives you uh, a term like r to the delta one uh-huh you do cases and in a lot of the subcases it, you're actually done except for like one subcase then you do uh, the other auxiliary lemma in order to provide a different gradient estimate and then you do the lemma that uses the gradient estimate in order to get another a different r to the delta 2 which is going to be bigger than delta 1 so you do the cases again and then for the other subcase you sort of repeat and what you find is that the delta case are uh, increasing so you get to the point where it's bigger than the exponent that you want n minus 2 plus 2 alpha which and note that r is less than one so eventually you get the thing that you need so it is a lot uh-huh and of course like um i'd be happy like to answer any questions and stuff like that i i think i should leave my email i'm not sure if i left my email on the channel uh-huh so yeah there uh, that's that uh what we're gonna do next is um if we strengthen the conditions on the leading coefficients um, we can actually say something more about the solution. So at this point, it's just the alpha. But the next part is we can actually show that it's C1 alpha. So even its first derivatives are uh, Hilder continuous. I'm thinking of um, doing also a counterexample because Han and Lin discusses a counterexample at the end of the chapter. And after we're done with that, the perturbation methods, we're going to move on to like the big parts, um, the, uh, the Georgi uh moser iteration which doesn't rely on continuity assumptions to get um hilder continuity which i think is like really cool and eventually led to the solution of hilbert's 19th problem okay so yeah that's that um and this has been like a very long thing it's just like one theorem but it's like very technical and i hope that it emphasized that yeah um, regularity theory for pdes is um exciting <laughs> Um, uh, it's exciting because um, yeah it, it requires a lot in order to get them to prove results and stuff okay so yeah there's that uh, thank you for uh, watching uh, I'll see you uh, I'll see you some other time